Good morning, church. It is Christ the King Sunday, that time every year where we stop and we think explicitly for just a little while about Christ being King. Actually, if you'll remember from last week, it is such an important thing this year that we have spent two weeks talking about it. We started last week just by pointing out that Jesus is indeed king. In his resurrection, he gained victory over the dark powers. In his ascension, he now rules over all the heavens and the earth. Christ is the king. But we want to make sure that this doesn't just become a slogan or some sentimental thing that we just cross-stitch and put in our bathrooms. We want to make sure that we let the notion of Christ, the reality of Christ reigning, have all of the teeth that it does in the Bible. And so this week we want to begin with a bit of a controversy. Um, this is only a controversy for the most part if you're on social media. And uh, for the most part, I'm trying to stay off of social media. This controversy is one of those reasons. But a few weeks ago after the election, one of the things that you noticed is that many people started posting across the spectrum of Christianity that Jesus is King. Oftentimes the post would just say something as simple as that. Jesus is king, or regardless of who wins the election, Jesus is king. And in the face, or the wake rather, of those posts, there uh, came an interesting pushback from a variety of Christians on the other side. Uh, they commented things like saying Jesus is king is not helpful, or remember Jesus was king when everything was going bad in previous times, like the Holocaust, or the Great Depression, or Jim Crow South, or um, saying Jesus is king is not a useful thing at this time. And so there was this pushback and it intrigued me. And so I started paying attention to uh, the conversation between those posting Jesus is king and those saying it's not helpful for you to say Jesus is king. And uh, I came away with two conclusions that I think highlights where we want to go in our lives with Jesus in the scripture today. On the, first time, on the first side, many of those objections to those posting Jesus and king, is king was a very contextual sort of thing. Uh, it turns out that a good number of people, certainly not all of the people posting things like Jesus is king, were people who had spent the last year living their lives, at least as far as social media goes, pretending that Jesus wasn't king. That is, they lived their lives in such a way that it seemed as if they thought that we were in this by ourselves, that unless our candidate won the election, then everything was going to fall apart and that nothing would be okay. And so they took it upon themselves, whichever candidate it was they were supporting, to bash the other candidate and to support their candidate no matter what. And all sorts of ugly things with which you are familiar ensued. And so the objection, I think, rightfully arose that there's a certain hypocrisy to spend a year living as if someone else is king, as if this is all in our hands, and forsaking the politics of Jesus, his way of being neighbor, of being community, of laying down power, of taking up love, of following the way of the cross, these things that we've been talking about, to forsake all of that for the sake of taking up the politics of the world. That is, that... Um, there's something disingenuous about saying Jesus is king after living like he wasn't king. And so there was a pushback against that. This temptation to think that we are in it by ourselves and instead of following the way of Jesus to take up the politics of the world. And on the other side, there were those who uh, said Jesus is king. And I'm broad brushing. These are two main camps. These are not all of the camps. But uh, there is another camp where they fall into the temptation to say, well, my life is comfortable. And everything's going well for me. And whoever is elected doesn't change my life all that much. So it must be true about everybody else. So all of this is much to do about nothing. Jesus is king. Don't worry about it. And what this oftentimes becomes, and here I speak from personal experience because I have lived in this position at certain points in my life. Uh, they would take up a position that basically neither on the one hand takes up the politics of the world, which is good enough as far as it goes, but they don't either take up the uh, politics of Jesus and love their neighbor because they are comfortable in the world. In other words, saying Jesus is king is a position of apathy. And so on the one side, we have those who have forsaken the politics of Jesus, claiming his lordship to take up the politics of the world. And on the other side, we have those who uh, claim the lordship of Jesus. Jesus is king, but they really don't take up the politics of the world or the politics of Jesus. They just have this position of comfortable. And if I'm comfortable, everything is cool. 
And so there's that pushback, that controversy. And what really concerned me about it is we took this notion that ought to be the bedrock of our life and the world. Jesus is king. And it is turned into because of the way that many in American Christianity have handled it. The way I have handled it, to be fair, at points in my past and in times when I'm not at my best. We've taken this notion that ought to be the bedrock of who we are. And we have turned it into a matter of scorn and ridicule. It is now at the point to where, because of the way we broadly have lived our lives, that to say Jesus is king is no longer a matter of good news for people, but it is something that can be dismissed as apparently untrue. It either speaks to one side, the privilege that does not need to be concerned with the plight of our neighbors, or on the other side, it is jettisoned for the sake of the politics of the world because that is the way the world works and we have no room for the way things should work. But today what I want to do is I want to talk about, I mean, just for a few minutes, this third way of looking at it. And the third way of looking at it says that it is true. It is the reality that Jesus is king, but um, saying Jesus is king involves on the one side a rejection of the politics of the world, the politics of fear and accusation and power that has animated so much of the political discourse in our country. And on the other side, it also rejects the way of apathy, of comfort, of saying, oh, it doesn't really matter what I do. I don't have a lot to do because I'm pretty comfortable. It's all good. Uh, rather, it calls us to seriously and faithfully and creatively and wisely follow Jesus in his way. To say Jesus is king is a call to Christ-like a call to cruciform action in faith and trust that laying down our power and taking up the way of the cross and following Jesus is the way forward for the world. That is to say that when we say Jesus is king, it ought to be something that helps us embody the reality that when God wanted to fix the world, what he did is he sent his son and gathered a people around him rather than electing a president or a senator or a congressman or an emperor or installing a CEO or promoting someone to general or whatever the case may be. And so I want to look at this just in a couple of passages that, that kind of highlight this notion to say Jesus is king is a call to action. It is both realistic and it is not sentimental. It is a call to actually follow Jesus into the world and to love our neighbors and through loving our neighbors to actually love God. That's what it means to love God. Uh, the first one we find in the early chapters of Acts, and we're not going to go into any great detail on these. This is a part of the Bible that you're familiar with, and I would encourage you to sit down this afternoon and read the first four, five, six chapters of the book of Acts if you have a little time. But we began last week in Acts chapter 2, noting that Peter's sermon, the highlight of his sermon was the kingship of Jesus. He tells the crowd there gathered in Jerusalem on Pentecost, this Christ whom you have crucified, God has both declared to be Lord and Christ. Those are two terms used for royalty. It was the kingly nature of Jesus that God has declared. And Peter says now he is seated at the right hand of the Father. That is the position of authority. He is reigning. He is in charge of all of heaven and all of earth. And so Peter's sermon was a declaration that Jesus is king. And the crowds there, they had backed the wrong king. Rather than saying Jesus is Lord, they had cried, we have no king but Caesar. And realizing the mistake they made, they uh, then ask Peter, they interrupt his sermon, we've made a mess of things, what should we do? And it's there that Peter gives that famous line, at least for us in the churches of Christ, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it should be clear by now, we've talked about this many times over, that those terms, repent and be baptized, those both have to do with their pledging allegiance to Jesus as king. Forsake your loyalty to Caesar as king, the politics of the world, the way things are. Give your allegiance to Jesus as king, the way things ought to be, the politics of the kingdom. 
And what we find moving out of that is, of course, on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people pledged allegiance to the Jesus administration. Jesus is king, they declared, in their repentance and their baptism. And then thousands more followed in the days after. But what happened is that this community that was formed around the reality of Jesus' kingship then went out and began to live a drastically different sort of life. We see them taking care of the needs of one another. They had this unique situation where the church was formed in Acts chapter 2 at a time when Jews had come from all over the world. They had intended to stay for a short period of time, but now they were staying for a longer period of time. A good many of them were actually locals who weren't going anywhere, but perhaps they were poor. And now under the kingship of Jesus, we have this notion of taking, taking care of radically loving our neighbor. And so they began to sell their property. They began to sell everything they have. They held nothing as their own. They used what resources God had placed in their life, what resources they had gained to take care of one another in radical ways. And by the time we come to chapter four and chapter five, what we find is that everybody in the area began to take notice of the way the church was living. Some of them were afraid of them. Some of them walked in fear and trembling around them. Others looked at them and saw something attractive and joined their ranks. But everybody took notice because for the early church, and this is what I'm driving here, for the early church, when they declared the kingship of Jesus, Jesus is king, it was not mere sentiment. It was not just something you say when you might not get your way by other means and now you want to kind of be comforted in that moment of fear. It was not something you say as a way of dismissing the problems of the world, but it was the impetus. It was the force. It was the prompt, the motivation to actually tackle the problems of the world. Jesus as king led them to actually take care of their neighbors, to actually bring about healing, to actually bring light into darkness. It was a call to action, and through that action, they began to turn the world upside down. Jesus as king was a call to action. And the next one uh, is not so much related directly to the notion of Jesus as king. There's no sermon being preached saying Jesus is king and people pledging allegiance to Jesus, but... Uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, a text that we all love and we're all familiar with, we, we have in Ephesians chapter 3 as well, we have this same notion. Beginning in verse 11 of Ephesians chapter 2, uh, Paul is going to talk about all of the things that Christ has accomplished on the cross and in his resurrection and now what that means for him to have ascended and be seated at the right hand of the Father. That's how he ends chapter 1, by the way, the authority, the kingship of Jesus. And he says, that what Jesus did is he brought about in taking his throne a fundamentally different reality from the reality of the world. In the world, we put up all of these walls. In their day, it was the wall between the Jews and the Gentiles. In our day, it would be the walls between black and white or rich and poor or, or blue collar and white collar or young and old or liberal and conservative or, or traditional and progressive in church terms. Or we could keep going. We love to put up our walls. But Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 11, that Jesus is the one who tears down walls. And in tearing down the walls, listen to what he says. He says he has taken the two humanities. There is us and there is them. There is our way of doing life and there is their way of doing life. And we are right and they are wrong and we are good and they are bad. He is taking the two humanities and he has formed them together into one new humanity. So in Galatians 3, for instance, he would say there is no more male, no more female, no more slave, no more free, no more Jew, no more Greek. We are all one in Christ Jesus. In Galatians, by the way, that was the impetus for a radically different practice. That was why it was wrong in Galatians chapter 2 for Peter not to eat with the Gentiles when his Jewish brethren from uh, Jerusalem came. Because now we're all in this together. We eat at the same table. We're part of the same family. And so Paul in uh, Ephesians chapter 2 paints this radical vision, this very different way of looking at the world. We're not building walls, but we're tearing walls down where reconciliation is the norm, where peace has been made. And then having expounded at great length on this, the result of the kingship of Jesus 
he comes around in chapter three and he says, now in this reality, the no Jew, no Greek, no slave, no free, no male, no female, the all one in Christ reality of Jesus that he has brought about on his cross and his resurrection and his ascension. He says, now we see declared through the church, the manifold wisdom of God to the powers. And the powers there, they're the ones who rule over both in the spiritual realms and the physical realms. It's a, a conglomeration of those two things. The powers that rule over the way things are through the church. God is declaring the wisdom of his way of doing things, the way things ought to be to the way things are. And we don't necessarily, in the context of Ephesians chapter 3, we don't primarily, in the context of Ephesians chapter 3, do that through voting or for writing our, from, for writing our senators or our congressmen or from protesting or taking part in democracy, although there are conversations to be had about all of those things. I'm not ruling those out, but we do that primarily by living a life as a community that says Jesus is king, and that changes everything and it changed everything for the early church and the early church was able to turn their world upside down because they realized that the call to the kingship of Jesus was a serious matter that could not be rejected in favor of the politics of the world and could not be reduced to mere sentiment but rather was a, a, a clarion call a call to action in the world in the way of Jesus. And so here is the deal. If we are going to claim Jesus is king, we must be willing to get up and act as though we are the church that God has designated to be light in the midst of darkness in taking up the way of Jesus. Otherwise, that call, Jesus is king, will mean nothing not only in our lives, but to the lives of those around us. And so Jesus is king. Let's go live like it. Let me pray for you, and then I'm going to ask you to pray with me. Then we'll remember who we are. I think we can get all this done before the file kicks off. Lord, we pray that you would give us the wisdom and the eyes and the strength and the creativity to live out the reality that Jesus is king. Help us to be bold and fearless in loving our neighbors and taking up your way. Lord, grant us the faith to be your people. And now we come and we pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. Let me grab my sheet real quick and we will remember who we are. We shall love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind, and with all our strength. This is the first and greatest commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. We love because God first loved us. Anyone who says they love God but hates their brother or sister is a liar. How are you going to love God whom you have never seen if you can't love your brother or sister whom you have seen? So this is the command we have from him. Those who love God must also love their brother and sister. Church, we love you, and I hope you have a good week. Bye.